Okay, good afternoon everybody. Claire Rees here from Intrabiz Sweden and today I have with me Jamie and Jamie is a public speaker with a difference. He specializes in leadership, he brings his talks to life with fascinating examples of how to learn the skills needed in our everyday lives as well as in business. He spent over 10 years as a senior executive level in business. Jamie really engages his audience with both his knowledge and experience. So come with me today and enjoy um, uh, Jamie's speech and what he's got to say to us here in Sweden. Welcome, Jamie. Thanks for having me, Claire. You're welcome. Looking forward to this. Great. So let, let's, let's start then, first of all, um, who you are and um, what you actually do. So as you said, my name is Jamie. For those of you looking at my name on the screen, it's pronounced Joe Vanelli, but don't worry if you get that wrong, that's absolutely fine. Um, but give me a little bit of background of uh, why I've ended up doing this. So I started out in, in sales um, back in 1998. Um, if you want to say I don't look old enough, that's fine. Um, but I started out and I had no clue. I had absolutely no clue what I was doing. And I started, it was actually in car sales. I was in the motor trade for, for almost 20 years. And uh, I, I got a job. Um, I got trained on the job. And my manager was absolutely terrible. But mm. the reason that's kind of amusing to me now is I didn't know he was terrible. Because then I got another job. Um, and that manager was exactly the same. And it wasn't until about six years into my career doing it that I started working for another company. I started gradually building my way up. And I had um, uh, a manager that, that employed me. And he's someone I refer to so much now in my talks, a guy called Ian Hopkins. Um, and he's now retired, but I still, still speak to him regularly. Um, and it was him that made me realize that the way things had been for the last six years were not normal. I thought they were normal because I knew no different. And I actually spent uh, eight years working for Ian for a company and he made such a difference to me that as I then moved on again uh, once I'd finished there it's, I sort of went backwards in terms of how we were being led and it sort of made me realize oh hang on a minute why is why is everyone so different when ultimately it should be the same job and a few years go past and I, I, I worked for another company and I was so disappointed that he wasn't still my leader there um, and like I say, I still speak to him now and I, I, I ring up and I'll ask him questions and sometimes he, he says what a great idea something is and sometimes he'll tell me, go, go back and rethink that one if I were you. Um, and it got to the point I was working at senior executive level for, um, actually for BMW and it, it got to the point I realised, do I want to be doing this for another 20 years? Now, there's huge parts of the job that were fantastic I really enjoyed but there were parts I just I was getting frustrated because the way it was run um, and I don't mean that I wanted everything my own way I'd just seen how it could be done so much better mm. and and I wanted to make a difference really and I got to the point I was like can I do this for the next 20 years or do I actually want to help people become better at their jobs and as we we naturally evolve and we change over time and that's what happened. I wanted to help people more. So people now say to me, oh, you're a motivational speaker. And I am not a motivational speaker. I'm an educational speaker. But very quickly, the difference is an educational speaker is people like myself, where we have learned through years and years of experience um, and training. And what we want to do is we want to educate other people to help them become better at what they do. A motivational speaker is someone very different. They have interesting stories to tell, generally have been through something rather a, a, a huge grandeur themselves. And they can explain how their, their mind and everything got through it to where they are today. Mm -hmm. I don't have those interesting stories, but I have the experience I like to try and share with people to, to, to help them better themselves if that's what they want to do. Mm -hmm. mm. That, that's, that's a, I think, for me as well, you know, it, it's like we've always um, come across those bosses, haven't we? That uh, 
you just think, oh, well, I could actually do their job 20 times better than what they, they are actually doing. Because you want to be led you, when you're, you're actually working for somebody. You want to be led in a positive way so that you can actually, you know you're doing a good job and you want to do a good job for yourselves. Yeah, of course you do. I mean, there's, there's a big thing I always say to people. Um, there's, there's a huge difference between management and leadership. And a very simple way to explain it is to be honest, anybody could go into a job and become a manager. Uh, a manager's job is basically, in very, very, very simple terms, is to delegate tasks. You have a, an end game and it's to delegate tasks to people who work for you uh, and to get jobs done. And at the end of it, you can, you can track their progress along the way and, and the ultimate goal is to get that job done. Mm. A, a leadership role is very different. You'll have people at the very, very tops of companies that are not good leaders at all. But you'll have people that work on you know, effectively the, the ground floor, the, the shop level. Um, and they, they will have great leadership skills, but they're not utilized properly. Mm. Some people find it quite natural uh, and some people have to work at it and that's not an issue at all. Um, but there's a very, very big difference. Um, and I've had companies say to me in the past, would you come and do a management course for our, for our senior managers? And I said, well, I, I can, but that's not what I do. Mm. What I want to do is teach you skill sets Mm. become better leaders mm. so a quick story i many many years ago i actually got sent away for a three-day course to do a leadership course and i'll never ever forget this and it sticks with me which is one of the reasons why i want i like doing what i do now is the gentleman in question who was running the course came up at the front at the start and one of the first things he said to us was if you pay attention and you do what i tell you to do at the end of this course, you will be a good leader. And I thought, what a ridiculous thing to say. Mm -hmm. How can you become a good leader in three days? It's, it's impossible. What you can learn is the skills that are necessary, but then what you have to do is take those skills away. You have to adapt them into your own style and you have to constantly, constantly practice them. Um, something I say a lot is I, I'm a huge sports fan. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't really matter what the sport is. I, I, I love my sport. Um, and if you talk to any professional sports person and say to, and say to them, how did you get good at what you did? It's, it's repetition. It's because they keep doing what they've learned. So um, we had an online event a few weeks ago with Intrepids, uh, and there was an Olympic athlete, Jamie Walsh, on there. Mm -hmm. And he's a perfect example because what happens is he gets good at something and then he keeps doing it. So... If he stopped doing that, if he stopped running for a year and went back and carried on, he would not be anywhere as good as he was when he left. Mm -hmm. The fact he constantly practices it is why he gets better and better and better. And in the end, reaches the absolute pinnacle, which is going to the Olympic Games. Um, and you can use, I, I use Jamie Walsh as an example there because we, we had a, an online thing the other day, but you can use any professional sports person in the world. Mm -hmm. um, the more you practice something, the better you become. So when this guy stood up and said, in three days, I'll make you great leaders, um, it, it made me laugh internally. Um, some people loved it because at the end of it, they got their, their certificate to take away, to put on their wall in their office. And now they don't mean a thing. <laughs> what, what actually matters is practicing it, getting yeah. good at it. And other people, when you see them improve, that's how you know it's working. Absolutely. And I, I think what, what, you know, I always connect these type of um, learnings to whatever learning I've ever done and whatever learning other people have done is that once you've got that certificate, it doesn't mean that you're the expert. It gives you the, it gives you the, the, um, the knowledge and the experience to go out there and implement it. It's like driving a car. When you learn to drive a car, you know, I, I said to my son, you might have passed your driving test, but you can't drive yet. Wait until you're about 60. <laughs> And then you can say you can drive. <laughs> do, do as, like you said there, there's, you use driving the car as an example, but yeah. it's learning the different skills of, of driving the car. So can I steer? Can I use my mirrors? Do I know how to indicate? Can I go backwards? Can I put it sideways into a space? All different skill sets. But I want to take you for me through, for me, after, after years and years of studying this, there's eight different skill sets. Okay. That, make a great leader so i'm going to take you through them and they culminate the first seven culminate in number seven, in number eight so they are they're in no particular order um but they are empathy perspective 
accountability, vulnerability, morality. You can put ethics under morality, but to be honest, we should all be ethical anyway. So morality, communication, authenticity, one of the most important. Uh, and if you use all, all seven of those together, what actually happens, it comes to trust. You cannot get trust off somebody from day one. It doesn't work like that. Our, our brains are not trained to mm. instantly trust people. It takes time. You have to show them different things that will ultimately come to them trusting you. Mm -hmm. There is a caveat to that and that there is one person in the world that will trust you from day one. And that is your child. I don't know how many people listen to this or have children. I have one. Um, your child understands from day one when you pick them up yeah. that they can trust you. To be honest, they understand they can trust anyone because you're holding them and you don't drop them and they're happy with that. Um, but they understand trust from day one. Anybody else, it takes time. You cannot build trust from day one. If you look at networking, Claire, obviously this is, this is your area of expertise. Mm -hmm. um, people come to networking. You may meet someone there and you don't, you don't trust each other after day one. It doesn't work like that. It doesn't just click your fingers and it, and it happens. Mm -hmm. It takes time. You speak to them again and again and again. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the most simplest examples of this is, Claire, are you married or you have a partner? You do. So, Sorry, I'm married, yeah. <laughs> yeah so, you have to think about that. That's okay. <laughs> so when you met your partner, yeah. that, that very first time you met them, you didn't love them and you didn't trust them because you didn't know them. Yeah. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. What actually happens over time is you get to know each other. You go on a date, you go for dinner, you do whatever. You then spend more and more time together. Mm -hmm. You stay at each other's house. Mm. And eventually someone leaves a toothbrush in there to say, I'm, I'm not going anywhere. I'm staying here for a while. And then they have the key to the door. You wake up one day and you go, yeah, this, I, I trust them and I love them. And that's how relationships are built. So whether yep. it's in your personal life or your business life, they work in exactly the same way. And we can't get that overnight. And we have to accept that these things take time. Mm. And the more and more we practice them, the, the better at them we will get. Mm. And the more people will trust us. Do you think as well, you, you've just planted that seed in my head as well. Do you think in businesses, when you employ somebody, is that it's expected to have that trust straight away and we forget about building those relationships in our business then to create those relationships with the people that we're working with? Sorry, Kate, can you just say that again? It actually just went really quiet halfway through that. Right. Um, do you think in businesses and in the workplace, you know when you actually employ somebody um do you think that that trust is expected straight away when you've employed them they you, you you've gone through the interview process they come through the door and that you're ex, you're you've got that expectation then of uh, it's, it's a great question relationship what happens in reality and what happens in people's idealistic mind is, is very very different so in reality what happens you start a new job um and you go in and people will not give you lots of their time. That's just not going to happen. Um, they'll make you welcome. They'll make you feel welcome. Uh, they'll ask you about yourself and your family, etc. But there won't be an, a, a level of trust. There won't be, you know, I'm going to give up half my day to do this with you and this with you. Rightly or wrongly. Um, I think a level of trust is expected both ways, from the company to the employee and vice versa. Um, but it does. It will take time. Um, I think as if you go in as the new employee, you want to go in and show people that you are good at your job. Mm. Um, you've got to justify why they've employed you. You want to go in and show people that you can be helpful and you can be useful to them. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, you understand that, like I say, you have to justify why you're there. And it's, mm. it's expected, but I think everybody has to get the understanding mm that it takes time and it isn't going to happen straight away. Yeah. And I suppose that's with networking as well. Like you said, it's because you need to bring it. It's, just, it's not worth just turning up and expecting to gain that trust straight away. It's building that relationship. And yeah, absolutely. The, um, you've probably seen it a million times already. And I have doing networking is I've been to events and I've spoken to people for maybe 10 minutes and all that's happened is they've told me all about themselves and then tried to pitch themselves to me 
to get mm. business from me. Mm. I don't have ever spoken to that particular person again. No. Um, so I, I used to have a little thing when I was um, as a regional director for, for a company. What I used to say to my guys when they were out on the road and meeting new clients, I want you to come back and when we have our next meeting, I want you to tell me five things about the person you're meeting. I don't want to have a business. Yeah. I, I, can, I can Google the business. I can find out everything I want. I can go into, we have here in the UK, we have Companies House. I can go on, I can find their personal details. I can find out when they were established, what their turnover was. I can find all that out myself. What I want you to do is go out and find out five things about that person as an individual mm. and come back. So when you have your second meeting, not only is it more relaxed, but you started that very first small step towards an element of trust mm. because they, they understand that you're not just there to pitch to them. It's not, I want your business and I'm going to leave. It's let's get to know each other and let's make it work. Now, if you do it properly, what will happen is um, you will understand their needs better. This goes into a little bit more of a sales thing, but you'll understand their needs better and you, you can build a better relationship. And I always, I always say the, the best business relationships are ones that work both ways. Because mm -hmm. if it only works one way, there's no longevity to it. Mm -hmm. Eventually it comes to a standstill. Mm -hmm. and then it breaks down and once it breaks down you'll never get it back again mm -hmm. um, so if you learn it properly from the start and take a little bit longer and learn about the people and how you can help each other which we'll come on to later mm -hmm. um, it's, it's so much so much more important than just going in just to do a bit of business for the sake of it mm, definitely so just there's, there's one thing um, we have here again it may be slightly different in, in Sweden I uh, hope I'll come over later in the year and see you guys um, but here if you say to somebody here, who do you not trust? Mm -hmm. Generally, the answer is politicians. Yeah. There's a reason we don't trust politicians. I don't know if you have the same there, but we, we don't trust politicians here because of the, the way they answer questions. Mm -hmm. So what will happen is we'll, we see it on the TV every day. Uh, we'll ask a politician a question, and it can be something like, uh, if you get elected into power, how much money will you put into our national health service? Mm -hmm. and the answer is normally something along the lines of well I think what's important here is not how much we will do but what, what our competitors have failed to do over the last 10 years yeah. and they'll talk about them and tell them what they haven't done mm -hmm. but you haven't answered the question so what happens over time is we lose trust because we realize well hang on they don't want to answer the questions that they find difficult they only want to talk about what other people have done wrong to make themselves look better so our level of trust in them decreases Mm -hmm. and it, it gets to an all-time low and then we change parties etc so now if we look at that into a business term most of us have worked if we're honest we'll put our hands up and say we've worked for a, an employer or a company or we've had a leader in that company that we don't trust mm -hmm. and then when you say to some um, do you still work for them most people will say no and you say why not and they say because i don't trust them mm -hmm. And you let that sink in for a moment and you think, wow, that's crazy. And th th this is people in their own minds now. Some people unfortunately still work for people that, that uh, they, they don't trust, but that's, that's another issue. Um, but if you work for an employer that you trust, as an employer, your, um, the loyalty in the company increases massively. It's not all about money. People won't always leave for more money. Mm -hmm. um, and what you'll find over time your company will get better because mm -hmm. they have built trust in you mm -hmm. and and little things like that to try and get people to understand is so important but it's not always just about the business it's into your personal lives as well and, that, and like mm -hmm. i say we, we look at the politician side of things we look at our partners uh the, the element of trust is is huge and there's lots of different skills and lots of different steps we have to get to to get to that point mm -hmm. but it's 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 massive and and it's, it's something I try and push quite a lot. You'll hear me talk about trust a lot. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So just go through, because you actually said those seven points quite quickly then. Go um, on. Your, your seven steps. Is that your your um, your seven steps to being a great leader you were talking about? Or was it, or what do you think makes a, um, it's, it's like, for example, I had um, a company the other day and, you know, they said, Claire, I can manage, but I don't know how to lead. And there's a, and like you said earlier on, there's a great, there's a massive difference between those both. 
but you said earlier on about your seven steps to leadership. Is that what you were saying? Yeah. yeah. So there's, there's seven different skill sets that skill you set, use. Right, yeah. They're skill sets. Yeah, they're not, not key points, and they're just seven yeah. different skills. Yeah. Um, and so most people will, like, again, if I was on a stage now, I'd get people shouting stuff out. But um, the, most, most people understand that the communication is, is key. Yeah. Um, yeah. Not just how you say something, but when you say it, lots of different things. As, as I said briefly earlier, I have morality. It, it's huge. And some people say ethics, and ethics is absolutely right. But we have to assume in our world that most people will act ethically. Yeah. And um, I yeah. think anybody who watches this and comes to your events will have a, a, a damn good level of ethics. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's not really one you, you know, so it's not really one that we, we should be too concerned with, but you can put it under uh, mm-hmm. morality. Mm-hmm. One of them is, is um, accountability. Um, I think that's fairly obvious of how that works. We can't take all the credit when we don't want to take some of the blame. Mm-hmm. Um, but one, if I can just touch on for a moment, is authenticity. Uh, and this is one that works in your personal life as well as as well as your business life. So let me give you a, a little scenario. So I, I sort of mentioned it briefly there, but I say you go into a bar. Uh, a lot of my stories revolve around bars, so I don't know if that <laughs> says more about me than, than, it, than anyone else listening. It's either bars or sports. It's a, it's a good uh, illustration. Um, we'll, we can so let's all... say you go into a bar yeah. and you meet you meet somebody who you think, well, they're they're very attractive. And you go and talk to them and you start talking. You think, this is amazing, yeah. There's a bit of reciprocation. And you say to them, well, what do you like doing? Uh, what, you know, what's, what's your hobbies in your spare time? And they say, I love, uh, I love sewing. And you go, oh, I love sewing as well. Mm. And you have no idea how to sew. So they think, wow, they, he's really good. He, uh, he's nice to talk to. And I find him quite attractive. Uh, and he likes sewing. That's amazing. I've never met anyone who likes sewing in my life. So you say, let's go on a date. Mm-hmm. So you go on a date. And by the second date, you get to know each other a little bit more. Mm-hmm. And they will say to you, so when did you start sewing? And you go, oh, yeah, I forgot I said that. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, just recently, to be honest. Yeah. yeah. And they go, how recently? And you go, well, look, tomorrow? <laughs> yeah. And what happens is instantly... You're not being yourself no. because you're trying to make up for what you said. Mm-hmm. So eventually you'll get found out. Mm-hmm. And it's not about lying because it's very difficult in business. Um, sometimes it's very difficult to be very, very honest. And, and uh, I don't mean blatantly lying to people. I had it before a junior member of staff came to me and said, I've heard we're going to go into a merger with this other company. Is that true? Mm. Now I couldn't say, yes, that's true because we're all under non-disclosure agreements. Yeah. But I also, I can't say to them, no, that's absolute rubbish. I don't know where you've got that from because that's an outright lie. Mm-hmm. So you have, to, you have to sort of put it in a certain way. I said something along the lines of, um, oh, wow, where have you heard that from? And he said, oh, I heard so and so saying, and said, oh, Leave it with me. I'll look into that. And uh, once I've heard something, I'll come back to you. Yeah. I didn't say yes or no. Yeah. Which some people say it's a very politician's answer, which is what you talk about. And I get that. There's some yeah. things you can't say. Yeah. But eventually you'll get found out if yeah. you constantly lie, if you're not authentic to yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, there's, a, there's a guy I follow a lot with Simon Sinek. And he tells a great story where he says, um, if you went up to your let's say you went up to your husband one day and said, how should I dress so that you will like me more? Mm-hmm. Or you went up to your friends and said, how do you want me to behave mm-hmm. so, so you'll like me even more? They're going to say, well, just be yourself. That's why we like you. That's, yeah. why, that's why you're here. That's why I'm married. That's why you're my friend. Mm-hmm. But that's the same thing as basically saying to someone, you know, you should be like this or why don't you do this? It's, there's so many different ways of doing it. Mm-hmm. Authenticity is so important. Mm-hmm. And again, once it's a skill that you understand and you learn, people will trust you more. Yeah. And the, and the, the more these skills you can get, the more and more people trust you. And that, everything will come back to trust. There's, um, 
there's a few dates that I, I often talk about in my speeches. So I just, I'm going to jump to one of them now, um, just, just while we're on that subject. So the date is somewhere between 382 and 322 BC. Um, so this is not going to be an exact quote, but it comes from Aristotle, who was obviously a great philosopher of his day. Yeah. And he, he said, we are what we repeatedly do. Yeah. We are what we repeatedly do. Mm -hmm. Like I say about the sports, sports stars, they repeatedly do it, they get better. Mm -hmm. And he also says that, that excellence is not an act, it should be a habit. Mm -hmm. So if you constantly learn the skills you set out to learn, you'll become better and better. Like I said, that's not an exact quote. There was a book in 1926 called The Story of Philosophy, which was written by, by a guy called Will Durant. And obviously there's, a, there's probably a slight translation in there somewhere. But we are what we repeatedly do, and, and I always remember that. And it's something that, that I follow quite religiously. Um, mm -hmm. If you, if you want to learn something, keep practicing it. So mm -hmm. I relate back to when the guy said to me, if you listen to me for three days, you'll be a great leader. It's just a, just a nonsense statement. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Do you want me to, I tell you something, the other dates which, which relate to um, some of the skill sets, if, if you want to entertain me for, for a couple of minutes on those. Yeah. Um, on the 28th of August in 1963. Yeah. Does that ring any, any bells? I normally got one person who gets this right. There's only me and you now, so I feel like I'm putting you on the spot a little oh, bit. Oh, no, 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 and I'm rubbish <laughs> this. Yeah, that was 10 years before I was born. <laughs> Say that again. That was 10 years before I was born. <laughs> yeah, me too, but uh, <laughs> it's the 28th of August, 1963. Yeah. One of the skills, authenticity again, great story, was the day that Dr. Martin Luther King stood up on the March to Washington oh, and cool. told the world that he had a dream. Mm. Um, now, what you got to remember back in those days, that there was no social media to advertise what he was going to do. Mm. What actually happened was a quarter of a million people turned up to listen to his dream. Mm -hmm. And the reason they turned up was not because... They wanted to hear about his dream. So his dream was civil and economic rights and term racism in, in very simple terms. They didn't turn up to listen to his, him talk about his dream. Mm -hmm. The reason all those people made the effort to turn up was because they had the same dream. Yeah. They believed the same thing as him mm -hmm. because he was authentic to himself and that's what he wanted. And he was, he was proud to tell the world all the other people that had the same dream as him, well, not all of them, but, quarter of a million people of them turned up to listen to him mm -hmm. so what that shows is two things one he was being authentic to himself and number two he, he understood that not everybody would agree with that now unfortunately we still live in a world where some people still don't agree with that but that's a whole other topic way above my education uh, mm -hmm. level um, but they all had the same dream and now there's more and more people have that dream mm -hmm. it, but it, that's where it started so he understood he can't attract everyone, but he attracted the people that believe the same thing. Mm -hmm. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. well, another day, which, which I always talk about, is the 24th of June, 1995. I'm a huge rugby fan. It was the Rugby World Cup final. It was South Africa against New Zealand. Yeah. And it's known for Nelson Mandela, uh, Nelson Mandela uniting a nation, yeah. as he called the Rainbow Nation. He, there's a story he went into the, the dressing room beforehand to speak to the players and he was in tears. Mm -hmm. Now this is a man who is widely regarded as the greatest leader of our time. Mm. And he came out with, with a very, very simple sentence that day. Okay. He said, sport has the power to change the world because it has the power to inspire. Yeah. And it has the power to unite people in a way that little else does. You looked at it recently last year with um, the South Africa winning the, the Rugby World Cup again. We won't talk about the fact they beat England because it's still a little bit sore to me. Being <laughs> <You laughs> a proud Englishman, part of the story. <laughs> this is, has the power to unite people in a way that little else does. Yeah. And it's so true. But the, 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 the sentence earlier, it has the power to inspire. Mm -hmm. how, many pe how many people that watch something as a child and went, yeah, I want to I do that. I want to be like that. Mm -hmm. I want to be that sportsman. I want to be that, you know, I want to be what she does. I want to do, do what they do because it's inspired them. Yeah. So your job as a leader is to inspire someone to become the best they can be. And while that was in a sporting context, doesn't that work in every aspect of our life? 
you look at our children, and I think we all dream for our children that they can become the best they can be. Mm-hmm. And we actually want them to become better than we, we could ever be. Yeah, yeah. And that's just a dream of inspiring them. We want to inspire them mm-hmm. to become the best they can be. Yeah. That's, that's leadership. All right, yeah. it's parenting as well. That's leadership. And, and for me, it, it's absolutely amazing. But the other day, which I won't, I won't bore you with too much, is the 12th of December 2014, uh, which is actually where my daughter was born. And it's sort of, this is when actually all this started clicking with me. Hang on, I need, I need, to, I need to be a better person to, so she can be, become the best she can be. Mm-hmm. I need to learn more. I need to learn about how I can be better. Um, and this is how this whole story came about. Me end up sitting here talking to you today. <laughs> So I think maybe what I'm getting, and this click, like clicking with, with me as well, is that, that leadership is about being, knowing who you are and finding out the person that you are so that you can lead by an example. Because that's one thing, isn't it? When you're telling people what to do and how to do it, it's not so inspiring for them. You just got the so robot. Telling people what to do is, is basically management. Yes. That's a manager's job. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but as you, as you said there, leadership is inspiring them to do it well. It's showing them how to go. It is, you said leading by example. Mm-hmm. It is, but that can be in every aspect of life, I mm-hmm. believe. Um, but it's, if I go back to, to Ian Hopkins, who, who I use as, a, as the inspiration behind all of this, really, for me. Um, I, I've actually sat down and spoke with him. And he said to me, that was never his aim. He said, he wants everyone to do well, but his aim is not set out to be a great leader. Mm-hmm. I think it's, it's natural instinct. And as he's admitted to me before, that he learned certain skills and he tried to make the best of those skills, mm-hmm. understanding himself. We can't all be perfect. Um, so if we have to understand ourselves first. Mm-hmm. And the more we can do that, we can use the skills. And what will actually happen is somebody else will then start to learn their own way. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I use Ian now as a, like I say, as a, a sort of example for me. Um, and I look back, and in fact, I'll tell you a story. Uh, somebody once said, who's your best teacher when you was at school? Do you remember that, who they were? I remember my best teacher, yeah. Her name right. was Davis. Yeah. Now, if I said to you, name the other 10 teachers that you had it's probably quite difficult maybe i don't know you can name some of them but not I, all of them yeah no no so the fact that everyone can still remember mm. you know obviously me and you are what probably early 20s now there aren't we yeah of course <laughs> that's a couple of years <laughs> that's why um, you have to think. we can all remember our favorite teacher yeah now can you imagine if in 30 years time you ask some uh, you ask somebody who is it that inspired you mm-hmm. and they said your name yeah how amazing would that be that's a great achievement isn't it absolutely and yeah it's, it's not all about us no but we have an element of self-pride we mm-hmm. have an element of wanting to achieve for ourselves and that that's nothing wrong with that and the best example i can give i'll go back to to sport um, the best example I can give is there's two people um, at complete opposite ends of the spectrum. So one of them is probably one of the greatest athletes of our generation. Um, he was a multiple winner of the, the peak of his sport. Um, he was adored by millions and millions of fans. And he's lost everything. Mm-hmm. And that person is Lance Armstrong. Oh, yeah. So he won... I think it's seven Tour de France, so so much other stuff. And he made a decision that he would cheat to make himself better. So what that has done over time, yes, he won everything while he was doing it. And it mm. But when people first questioned him, are you cheating? He said no. Mm. And they questioned him again, are you cheating? And he said no. And this went on for years. Mm. And eventually he went on the Oprah Winfrey show and said, I'm a cheat. I, I, I take performance enhancing drugs, I have blood transfusions, got my oxygen levels, etc. And he came out and admitted he just a cheat from day one. Mm-hmm. Now what actually happened there is he lost so much more than just his accolades. Mm-hmm. He lost his sponsorship deals. He lost mm-hmm. all his corporate endorsements. Mm-hmm. 
and the biggest thing lost was the trust of every single person that ever followed cycling. Mm. And it finished, it's finished it. You'll never ever do anything like that again. Um, but I use another example. So um, I, I'm not I'm a huge football fan, but I quite like it. So there's a lot of argument about who is the greatest footballer in the world. Mm. I know you're in Sweden, but I can't say Zlatan for all the Swedish fans out there. Yeah. Um, Cristiano Ronaldo. He is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cristiano Ronaldo is one of the greatest footballers of all yeah. time. And there was, he actually, there was a documentary recently, and I urge anyone to watch it. It was with um, Piers Morgan, who's a highly unpopular TV presenter here in the UK. Yeah. Um, he openly admitted that he wants to be the best. Yeah. He's been authentic to himself. Mm. He's been honest. He said, I want to have all the records. I want to win all the trophies. But is it, he was pushed further and further. What he actually realises, he wants to become the best so that other people in his team can become better and they can all achieve more together. Uh, so right. Absolutely. Now, what you actually realise is, people say he's arrogant. I, I, don't think he, I, th- I thought he was for a while until I actually studied him a little bit and, and mm. tried to find out more. He, he openly admits he wants to be the best and there is nothing wrong with that. Mm. But he does it so everyone around him can achieve more. Yeah. Is, isn't that what the sort of person we all want to work for? Yeah. Isn't that the sort of person we all want to be involved with? Yeah. I think, I think it's amazing. Um, and my, like I say, my perception of him changed hugely. Um, and I just think that we can all learn so much from act- actually... Follow, not following people but actually learning from people we probably thought we couldn't learn from mm. yeah and I, and I think for people like that who are out in the um you know in the in the world and they they, they talk about their lives and they talk about what they want and they talk about the achievements that inspires us as well to to actually learn from them as well don't you think yeah I mean um there's lots of people we we learn from throughout our lives so um you know you you've got your two or three different businesses you have and you yeah. wouldn't just walk into one without knowing anything about it you, you speak to people who've done it before you you learn from uh, you know people with experience and you ask questions and you find out more and more and more uh, and that's absolutely that's that's the normal thing to do a lot of people are afraid to ask for help yeah. um but, but the, the truth of the matter is we, we can't actually achieve an awful lot on our own. We, we do need people. Uh, and it's very difficult to get that across sometimes, to say to someone, accept help. I, I was a prime example of it for most of my life. Um, mm. I thought I could do everything. And then you get to a point where that's I can't. I need, I need some help with this. Yeah. Um, but it's difficult sometimes for people to understand who to ask. Yeah. Uh, where's yeah. the right place to go for advice? As, uh, as a guy I talk about, um, I think I actually did it in one of the interviews events before. There's a guy called Professor Robin Dunbar. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you've heard of him, but he's, uh, he's a British anthropologist and he studies evolutionary psychology. Mm-hmm. Um, it's something I've read quite a bit of his work and he specializes in primate behavior. He's done it at Oxford yeah. University and Cambridge University as well as a few others. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, uh, he also does cognitive and evolutionary anthropology and explains the way we change over the years. So he's really, really interesting guy, if you're into that, which I am. Yeah. But he has a number, and he says, as a human being, we cannot uh, manage more than about 150 close relationships, which, when it comes to networking, this, I think this is quite an important thing mm. people should remember. We, do, we just can't maintain it. Our brains don't have the capacity to have more than about 150 close relationships. Mm. Um, and he... Got this between because he said there's um there's a correlation between the primate brain and the average social group size. Mm-hmm. So by using the, the human brain and working out a lot of maths, which are probably far cleverer than I can do, he said that 150 is about the right number. Now he mm-hmm. said a stable relationship is somebody that you would be happy to engage in conversation with if you bumped into them in a bar. Again, a bar. I don't know. Maybe this is just what I look for. For shopping. We'll go for shopping. Um, some people <laughs> can say that you can do more than that. Uh, yeah. They say it's between 100 and 250, but the common number is around 150. Yeah. So it's down to the, without getting too technically in science in it, it's the direct functions of your neocortex size, 
which is why some people can maintain a little bit more. Mm. But when, when you come to asking people for help, uh, knowing where to go, sometimes you can just ask, I'd say a random person, but somebody you know, who works in an office in another department, etc. cetera. Um, but you're not gonna have that relationship with them. It's the same mm. as the, the networking events. When people go there, they understand they can't, if you had an event with 300 people, there is no way you could get around those people and form a relationship in a day. That's, yeah. It doesn't work. It's not possible. Yeah. And at some point, you have to give, you have to give a little mm. to gain from somewhere else. Mm. And that's where, when you build a relationship, the trust comes in. Yeah. Um, and you learn who you can and can't trust. You learn the skill sets and you, you gain the right, the right connections to what you want. Um, but the idea of actually gaining help from, from someone else, people can be a little bit shy about it. Mm -hmm. uh, people can be a little bit embarrassed to say, I, I don't know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know the answers to this, which is vulnerability. Yeah. Another skill, being vulnerable and saying, I don't know this. I need you to help me before I make a, a damn big mistake and I can't back out of it. Yeah. Um, they're all skills that the, even, even the most senior CEOs in the world, that the best ones will have these skills. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we, we've, we've gone on to 40, 40 minutes at the moment, Jamie. Okay. Jamie, it's been absolutely amazing to... Um, Can I finish with one thing, if I may? I was just going to say, is there anything I won't, I won't do you for long to then. finish with? Yeah. Um, I just want to, because it, it's, it's very, very relevant to networking, so I think it's be quite good to, to put this in here. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know if, if, you're, if you're a Friends fan, fan the, the series Friends... Yes, I like friends. Yeah. There's a great episode which relates a lot to what I talk about, which is when Phoebe tries to find a thankless task, is it possible to perform a thankless task? Okay. Now, um, the idea behind it is to help somebody else that where you have no benefit to yourself. Yeah. Now, there's a lot of chemicals in our body um, that come out when we do good things. So things like if we say, yeah, I'm going to help you there, and you help someone make money, you do an introduction on network event, someone makes money, you think, well, I gain nothing out of that. Mm. Actually, what happens is, happens is you, you um, release chemicals like dopamine, which make you feel good. Mm -hmm. um, and when you get these good feelings, what you actually want to do is go and do it again and again and again. Mm -hmm. that's, why we keep, that's why we keep having sex, is because yeah. it feels good. Yeah. So, some people do it to procreate, but that's up to them. Um, <laughs> but we do it because it feels good, yeah. um, because we get the release of chemicals. Yeah. When it comes to networking, I would say go out and help people. We cannot achieve what we want to achieve on our own. No. Be prepared to speak to people. Be mm -hmm. prepared to help people. Um, and eventually what happens is you get the good feeling and you actually get your, your mental health becomes better, which is a huge thing at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, be prepared to do it. You won't always get something for yourself. That's okay. Yeah. Learn, yeah. learn to help other people as well. Yeah. It's, it's good to have our own opinions it, and it's good to understand the way we feel again authenticity yeah. be prepared to to help other people in the network if if that option if the opportunity arises absolutely i totally 100 percent agree that and and you you just get you just get that amazing feeling you, you know it's like it's like with us with the dog sledding as well as with with networking and building businesses up if you can help people and put a smile on somebody's face it it does even that split second can just make you feel good which gives you motivation then to want to do more and help people more doesn't it so it, yeah, absolutely it's, yeah well jamie it's been a pleasure an absolute pleasure listening to you and we've got some loads of golden nuggets there if anybody that you are planning on coming to sweden and networking and, and hopefully doing business with some uh, swedish businesses here um if anybody wants to get in contact with you how can they get in contact with you um, so you can contact me via uh, my LinkedIn page, which is Jamie Giovanelli. The spelling is uh, is out there for you, so you haven't got to worry about remembering it. Yeah. Um, please message me on there. I have um, an actual program which I, I do train people as well as the speaking work. So you can contact me there. That's the 1090 program, which yes. is the word 10, the word 90, the word program yeah. at yahoo.com. Please feel free. Um, otherwise, you know, contact me through Claire if, if there's yeah. something you want to hear more about. Uh, if you just want to ask some questions, I'm always available. Um, and, and hopefully, yeah, we can connect and, and see where it goes. Fabulous. Well, thank you very much for your time today. It's been a, such a pleasure. Thank you, Jamie. Thanks, Claire. Cheers.
think it's a one minute.